Okay, yep. Yeah. Why don't we start with that? The people you've spoken with already here at the G20, what have you discussed with them and how have they received your, your report and your, your ideas that you're bringing here? Well, I get a chance to present uh, my report later today. I think it, it'll be a, a positive session for them because they'll get a clear sense that there are ways to bring more countries into the, the world economy in a full way. And there are huge benefits from that. Uh, the improvement in the human conditions in those countries, the economic benefits of the supply and demand coming from those countries, the extra stability uh, from having those, those countries be uh, on the path to economic development. And so there's a broad set of things in the report, including a, a focus on innovation, including a focus on the relative responsibilities of each type of country, the richest, these middle income countries like China and Brazil, and then the, uh, the developing countries themselves. I'm intrigued with your emphasis on the rapidly growing economies. What has prompted that? Is it the darkening prospects for the richer countries, or is there something else behind that? Well, the whole way we think about uh, helping countries develop is very different today than it would have been 50 years ago. Back then, there were the rich countries and the poor countries. The good news is that we've had so much success that many of those poor countries have moved up. Uh, it's almost an economic miracle that. Uh, Brazil, Mexico, China, and many others are now lo no longer in need of aid and in fact are beginning the process themselves of contributing not only resources but particular expertise. So China with their rice expertise, Brazil with their soybean and cassava expertise. And so we have a larger group of countries helping a smaller group of countries and so our our leverage, our speed of innovation, our ability to help those countries out is stronger today than it's been in, in the past. And I think that's somewhat overlooked because it's a, a very positive story that aid and innovation have gotten us to this, to this point. What is the most effective thing that these rapidly growing economies in particular can do to help the poor in their own countries and other countries? Is there one area that you would really emphasize? Well, I think agriculture is iconic in that every country that's developed has been able to raise its agricultural productivity so that even the small farmers are feeding themselves, uh, their kids get nutrition, they have cash crops, and uh, particularly in the tropical areas, the farming techniques, the way you develop the seeds are somewhat different. So that's why it's wonderful to have uh, these middle-income success countries now joining in. In fact, our foundation recently signed agreements with China uh, that they're bringing their science and technology to these problems. With Brazil, uh, they're bringing their agriculture group called Embrapa that did such a good job to help out in Africa. And so it's at, just at the beginning, but we do see them be, becoming significant actors uh, to help the poorest countries, uh, which is both humanitarian but also in their economic interest. One thing that um, President Sarkozy said he talked about with President Obama this morning, they said they discussed ways for the private sector to contribute uh, to, to getting us out of the current economic difficulties we're in. Uh, they, Sarkozy notably mentioned the financial transaction tax. However, that's something that the White House has not been enthusiastic about. It is something that you have talked about, given that the U.S., Britain, some other countries are not in favor. Is it feasible? And what, what can we do in terms of taxation that could help development? Well, I don't think you're going to see a complete alignment between various countries of how they raise money, what taxes they use. Uh, there are forms of the FTT that countries that are trying to raise more money, particularly to meet their aid commitments, could use. And I mentioned in my report that uh, at modest levels uh, that, that that's already quite successful uh, for a, a number of countries. So it's, it's going to be each one looking at how do they get uh, to these aid commitments 
Uh, the UK is an example of a country where they've chosen to uh, meet the 0.7% commitment by using general revenue without a specific new tax. Others may do it in different ways. The key point is that money makes a huge difference. That the way aid is being spent nowadays, focused on innovation, focused on measurement, uh, means that the, the impact per dollar of aid is much higher than in the past. Couldn't it be even higher if there were an across the board global FTT? Well, it's, the world isn't, doesn't have one government. And you know, so you're just not going to have uh, complete alignment on how tax structures work in all the different countries. Uh, I hope some countries look at the uh, tax ideas in the report and consider those. Tobacco tax is another one. Uh, various fuel taxes uh, that, that would discourage CO2 emission is another uh, possibility. Coming back to this, this G20 summit, um, what's happening in Greece, of course, is has uh, occupied a lot of people's attention. The government may collapse. Greece may leave the euro. What do you think of all this? Do you, what do you think the, the G20 leaders should be doing? And do you think this is taking up too much of their time at this, at this summit that, when there are so many other problems in the world? Well, it's, I think it's great that the G20 leaders are here addressing both short-term and uh, mid-term issues. You know, I'm honored that I get a chance to come in and, and talk about the, the mid-term opportunity for drawing everybody into the world economy. I do think that will make the world economy more stable. In terms of the short-term issues, uh, you know, I feel optimistic they'll solve those. It's not something that uh, uh, is a focus of my foundation work, uh, so I, I don't have uh, the solutions for them, but uh, you know, they do need to address that, but in doing so, they do need to keep in mind that the 1% or so of government budgets that go to helping the poorest uh, that, you know, I believe that should be maintained and even grown. And have you met any resistance to that in your meetings so far? Any, we can't even pay off our own debts, how can we uh, maintain this 1%? Well, fortunately, uh, most countries have, have not cut their aid. Uh, you know, we have a lot of countries that are particularly generous on aid. Uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, Korea are, are some that are growing their aid in, in meaningful ways. Uh, budgets are tight. And uh, so I think it is a time where we need to uh, be, make sure every eight dollars is spent well. Uh, there's some best practices there. And we need to make sure the success stories, whether it's the, the vaccines that are uh, saving more and more lives, or the malaria bed nets, the AIDS drugs, the agricultural innovations. If we don't get those success stories out there, then voters are going to feel like, even though it's 1%, uh, they have this image from the past that it was sometimes not used in an, uh, in an impactful way. You talked about the vaccines and the seeds. Could you just give me a few kind of key points that you think are the most, um, the best return on investment, the things that, that countries can do the fastest and most effectively now to be able to make that, that camp, that, send that message to voters saying, look, we're doing this, and a year later say, look, we did this. Well, the goals of um, all of us are to have both economic development and improvements in the human condition. And health is, in many ways, the most basic. Uh, so I often look at this metric of how many children die every year and how do we bring that down. Uh, in the last 10 years, it's come down over 30 uh, percent to less than 8 million a year. The reason we think we can cut it in half again by 2025 is because of vaccines, that new vaccines are being invented and delivered. Uh, pledging conference back in June had a uh, lot of countries stepping up in a very generous way uh, to get those out. Uh, our foundation, a lot of countries are funding the research into creating new vaccines. Uh, we recently had progress on a malaria vaccine. So improving health, which surprisingly 
reduces the, the population growth is perhaps the most basic. Then you move up to agriculture where there we can provide better farming practices. Africa productivity is a fifth of that in the rich countries and the, the techniques to let them increase their productivity would both help them and help global food, food security. industries. It's been a problem for a long time. Do you feel like there's momentum now for change? Absolutely. This movement to have everyone who's buying minerals from a poor country report in a totally open way what money they've sent into that country. It's got uh, strong backing uh, in the United States. It's got Australia uh, who put together a, a pilot program for it. There's good discussions in the European Parliament about this. I actually think the pieces are coming together to make this a, a, a best practice that will help the poor countries make sure that the, the money they get uh, benefits their citizens broadly. Yes, I, there's a 75 minute session uh, that I get to open up with a, a 12 minute summary of my report and then um, uh, eventually uh, you know there'll be concrete action including the communique that comes out uh, you know there'll be another G20 meeting where uh, the next steps can be talked about but yeah that, all the different things in the report you know are there because I, I think there are opportunities. One, one last question on, on the note of uh, on the subject of extractive industries the president of Equatorial Guinea was invited here I to be honest I haven't seen him I don't know if he's arrived but that's a country that has uh, <laughs> been criticized shall we say for um, using the resources from extractive industries for corrupt purposes are you have you spoken to him are you planning to talk to, to him <laughs> are you talking to leaders such as the president of Equatorial Guinea about uh, what they should be doing? Well certainly uh, that's held up as an example where resource wealth is not benefiting the broad uh, population and um, you know, we that's the situation you don't want to get in. Uh, I don't have any particular influence uh, over him. I have not not met with him uh, but uh, you know, the, there were a lot of people who were uncomfortable uh, with him coming, but he is the, the head of the African Union, so I guess uh, he will be part of the meeting. And it does seem to me an opportunity for, if he is going to come, for the other leaders to put pressure or show him your report. Well, I think there's no doubt that uh, you know, the, he he'll get a sense that um, you know, that there's not a big much acceptance of the way he's running the country. Whether or not that makes uh, causes a change or not, I'm I'm not an expert on that. Yeah. Unless there's anything you would like to add about your mission here, or no, I think that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very.